thank you so much for being here. I'm honored to see all of you. Where's your other half? It's nice to see all of you. Please, those of you here also, uh, those of you at home, welcome as well. Please introduce yourselves to the people who are around you, to your right, to your left, in front of you, and behind you. Now, please join with me. Let's take a deep breath and close our eyes. We see in the middle of our mind a little ball of golden light. We watch this light as it begins to grow, larger and larger, until now it covers the entire inner vision of our mind. We see for ourselves within this light a beautiful temple, and we see a garden that surrounds the temple and a body of water that flows through the garden. We see that the inside of the temple is lit as well by this same beautiful golden light. And here we are, for we have been drawn together by the power and in the presence of God. We devote our time spent together tonight, all of our relationships and experiences of one another to him. We pray that we might be lifted up above and beyond the sorrows, limitations, and fears of this world. We think tonight, dear God, with great compassion towards all those who suffer and suffer needlessly. Tonight, particularly in our hearts, we pray for those who were in the fire in Oakland, California, and for their loved ones. May this great tragedy, dear God, be somehow uplifted in the minds and hearts of all those who are affected by it. In the midst of this catastrophic event, may they find peace and comfort. And so it is, together, we all say, Amen. <clears throat> Tonight, I want to talk about intimacy. I want to talk about sex, romance, but most particularly, the issue of intimacy itself. You know, in The Course in Miracles, it's very clear to us as students that, as The Course in Miracles says, complexity is of the ego. The ego mind is the mind that is alive within all of us until the point at which we're completely enlightened, evolved to the state of the full actualization of our divine potential. Until that time, we are too often, actually, often enough, at the effect of the ego mind the word that the Course in Miracles gives, along the same way that the ancient Greeks used the word. It's the idea of a small separated self. It is the very idea that I'm separated from you. And the ego mind tells me that I'm separated from you because the ego mind tells me that you are a body and I am a body. And if you are a body and I am a body, that means you're over there and I'm over here. Therefore, we are separate. So as long as I am at the effect of my ego's belief, you and I are separate. When I am recognizing you through the mental filter of my spirit, then I realize that on the level of spirit, which is beyond the body, there's really no place where you stop and I start. So how much more intimate could we be, really, than that we are each other? So through the mental filter of the ego, I seek intimacy. I try to build intimacy with you. But from the perspective of the Spirit, I accept that how much more intimate could we possibly be? We already are intimate. We already are each other. So whether I see you as separate from me or whether I see you as one with me makes all the difference in the world to my construct around relationships, to my attitudes, my energies around relationships, to my behavior, and then to the outcome of those relationships. The Course in Miracles says that we are on this earth to love as God loves. And God loves all of us equally because God loves all of us as one. Now, that doesn't mean that in terms of the form of relationship, we are to love every person in the same way. 
But in terms of the content of relationship, that is exactly what we are taught in The Course in Miracles, that we are to see each and every person as our brother. The Course in Miracles doesn't even use the word brother and sister because that itself implies a difference based on gender. The idea that we are brothers, the idea that we are one, means that there is a level of sacred communion that is the same whether I'm talking about my child or I'm talking about my spouse or my lover. Now, the ego mind says there's a kind of love for this and there's a kind of love for that. And the ego has its own rules. Now, the ego's rules, however, are set up in such a way as to foster the ego itself, and the ego is the belief that we are separate. Since the ego's very identity is the belief that we are separate, then any rules it has for relationship, while they might not appear to be, are actually dictates which, if we follow them, will increase separation rather than unity. That's why the Course in Miracles says that the ego's dictate in love is seek but do not find. We are always, when at the behest of the ego, we're always looking for love. We're always trying to make it happen. And often, in retrospect, we see that the very things that we were thinking and the very things that, things that we were doing, which at the time seemed like our efforts at getting love or making love happen, were the very things that tore it apart. So the Course in Miracles tells us that millions and millions of years, no, it says millions of years ago. It doesn't say millions and millions. It says millions of years ago, in time as we know it, we had the first thought, the Son of God had the first thought that we were separate. And that very thought of separation, the Course in Miracles says, is what actually gave rise to the manifestation of the world of the three dimensions in which we appear as separate bodies. And that interesting to me is the notion that that actually totally aligns with the Big Bang Theory, that this all happened in a moment. But, the Course in Miracles says, that any thought that is not aligned with the thinking of God, which in this case would be any thought that we are separate from each other, because it is not the thinking of God, is not ultimately true, it is a gigantic hallucination that we are all having. And that's what the Course in Miracles, like Buddha, says about the three dimensions, that it's all an illusion, actually. As, as uh, Einstein said, the three-dimensional world is a vast illusion, albeit a persistent one. It is totally fortified by our physical senses. My physical senses say you're over there. My physical senses say you are separate from me. So the development of what in some traditions is called the third eye, the development of the, the vision of the Holy Spirit, the, the evolved perception, is one in which we actually move beyond perception to knowledge. In the realm of perception, you act this way, you act that way, you make mistakes, I make mistakes, you're confused living on this planet, I'm confused living on this planet. It is the realm of, one word you could say, crucifixion. Crucifixion being, one word, for the way that the ego mind is constantly seeking to repudiate love and to invalidate our innocence and to create suffering, one word for which is hell. But the ego mind is your own mind. It's just that it is your own mind turned against you. And so the ego never says, hey, I'm going to lead you to the thinking and the behavior that's going to ruin this whole thing, going to sabotage the relationship completely, and basically make you undermine your good in every possible way. No, the ego mind says, hi, I'm your self-care. I'm your part of you that's going to take care of you, that's going to make sure you get what you want. That's why when we think in terms of relationships most of the time in our society, what do we think in terms of what are you looking for? What is it that you want? Sounds good, doesn't it? Sounds kind of hip, sounds a little bit trendy, certainly sounds sophisticated, that you get clear about what it is that you want. And the Course in Miracles would ask us to look at that and ask us if we've ever, in any situation, gotten what we really want by going after what we really want. Because what we really want, the whole notion that I'm here to get what I want, is by definition a repudiation of the deepest, most fundamental truth about myself, which is I don't need anything because I am complete. But if I do not ground myself in the realization that I already am everything, I already have anything, because I am complete in God, then I feel bereft, I feel lonely, and the ego mind has told me, 
It's okay that you feel cut off from the rest of the universe. It's okay that you have forgotten God. It's okay that you are completely disconnected from conscious contact with the ground of your being. In fact, it doesn't even tell you those things are okay because if it told you those things were okay, you might have a clue as to what the real problem is. Rather, it says you don't even have to worry about those things because once you meet that one special person, it'll all be okay. And that's why we all kind of melted when uh, Tom Cruise said to Zanae, uh, Renee Zellweger, you complete me. For about five minutes, we were all, oh, and then we're like, no, this is so sick, this is so sick, this is so sick. But at first, we were so like, oh, wouldn't that be lovely? Well, it's actually not lovely, and why is it not lovely? Because if I think that you complete me, I think I need you to continue to complete me. I need you to act in whatever way you were acting that made me feel like you complete me. I need you to be whatever way it was that I thought you were being in the moment when it felt to me like you completed me. So basically what I am is this emotional invalid who'd like to join at the hip with you. The Course in Miracles says it's actually not love, it's theft. I'm trying to steal something from you. I'm trying to steal a certain feeling from you. And what happens in that situation, as is obvious, is that the person, him or herself, became less and less important. The person, him or herself, became less or less important, and what became more important was my gigantic need. And then the Course in Miracles says, if you do give me that, once I get it from you and feel that I have stolen enough, although it will not be in my conscious mind that this is what went down, I will probably be ready to discard you anyway because I got what I needed. The Course in Miracles points out what is obvious to all of us, how sick this is, but most importantly, how much suffering it causes us. This idea that millions of years ago, we separated from God, put us into a situation where it is as though we are one wave in the ocean that is feeling that we are separate from every other wave. Now, obviously, no wave can be separate from any other wave. But the psychological construct there is important because if I think of myself as separate from all the other waves in the ocean, how could I not feel terrified of the ocean? On the other hand, if I realize that I am part of the ocean, I know that I am part of the power of the ocean, I feel complete in the ocean, and I know that when I move, it moves. When it moves, I move. It is completely different self-perception. If, however, I am at the behest of the ego mind, which all of us are in the sense that the ego, fear-based, loveless mind is the mindset that dominates this planet and which, into which we are trained from very, very young, from a very, very young age, led to believe that we are separate, then just as a little wave thinking it was separate from the ocean would feel terrified of the ocean, being taught that we are just separate from everybody else on the planet, of course it makes us feel lonely here, of course it makes us feel endangered here. Once I realize that I am one with all life, then I realize I am intimate with all life, and that is what is lacking in our world. We have lost our sense of intimacy with the sky and intimacy with the earth, intimacy with nature, intimacy with community, intimacy with art, intimacy with everything, including intimacy with people. Um, Sigmund Freud used to use the term polymorphously perverse sexuality. And the idea of polymorphously perverse sexuality was the idea that everything's sexual, everything's sensual. But what we have done at the behest of the ego thinking is we've taken the whole notion of the intimate self and the intimate experience of life and put it into this narrow container, which is basically the sex we have with one person. And so actually it creates great toxicity in our perspective on sex with one person. Number one, because as we already said, you're looking to that one person to be God, basically. Only God completes you, and you don't even need God to complete you. You are complete in God. So if I think of myself as incomplete, and I'm looking for another person to complete me, just a little bit of pressure. On the other hand, if I think of myself as complete in God already, I'm not looking for another person to complete me. I am looking for a person with whom to share my completeness. I remember once I was doing, many years ago, I was doing a, 
a weekend or a training or some seminar about love and talking to a bunch of women and and one woman said, "Well, Marianne, the way you talk about it, why would he, we would eat why would we even need men?" And I said, actually, uh, along this line, we wouldn't need men. We would desire them. And I'll tell you something. It is basic male psychology that a man produces into a woman's desire. He does not wish to produce into a woman's need. Because need is perceived by men as control. And men are hormonally programmed to not want to give something to a woman if she is demanding it. A man filters a woman's need as a demand because of the deepest level it is. So the idea that we are safe to desire without need is a spiritual construct. So the Course in Miracles says that millions of years ago, when we began to experience this existential hysteria, because we were experiencing ourselves as separate from the rest of the universe, the mind of the ego didn't want us to recognize where the existential hysteria came from. Because once you recognize where the existential hysteria comes from, you realize that my capacity to, be, to talk deeply into my intimacy with you as a friend, my intimacy with you as a friend, my intimacy with you as a friend makes me much healthier by the time I get with you later in the night for my intimacy as a lover. But what we do is because we don't realize go deep here, go deep here, go deep here, it's like you save it up all day and you're so hungry at the end of the night, which only works for a couple weeks, couple months, because it has a sexual heat to it. But that that is actually an illusion because you're not fueling the tank of what it really means. If I'm deep with you and deep with you and deep with you and deep with you, then by the time I get here, I have so much to give because I have been so full all day. And I'm not there to like, I need it, I need it, I need it. I'm there from I got so much to give, I've got so much to give, I've got so much to give, in the context of which the need that is sexual, et cetera, can remain hot and even be refilled. So the Course in Miracles says that when we first began to experience this existential hysteria, the Course in Miracles doesn't use that term, but we began to experience the panic, really, of our sense of separation from the rest of the universe, even though the answer was to remember our oneness with the rest of the universe, the ego instead came up with one of the biggest guns in its arsenal. As a matter of fact, I think the Course in Miracles says that the special relationship is the biggest gun in the ego's arsenal. The idea of specialness in the Course in Miracles is not a good thing. Because God doesn't think you're special. God doesn't think you're more special. You're not more special to God than she is. The whole idea that some people are more special is an idea of the ego and not of the spirit. The Course in Miracles says God loves all of us as one, and the ground of being that is the deep spiritual love is when we can love all of uh, each other as one. I've noticed as a student of The Course in Miracles that my friendships have become more romantic, my romances have become more brotherly. Because there is no longer this deep separation between the constructs of both. Because without that unity, what happens is that your friendships don't go as deep as they could go, and your romances don't go as friendly as they could go. You don't go into the actual space of radical truth-telling, because nobody is, is, is feeling safe to go into radical truth-telling. Why? Because I know you need me to be a certain way, or I need you to be a certain way way, which completely obliterates the experience of emotional safety that is true when both persons feel the permission to tell the truth as soon as we know it, kindly, because honesty with what that line, I don't know who originally said that, but I think it's a brilliant line, honesty without compassion is brutality. But that, that's the art of intimacy. That's really the art of romantic intimacy because you're close to somebody. You see what their issues are. So being able to really practice that art of telling the truth as soon as we know it, but with kindness and with compassion. That is the purview of the spirit. That is not the purview of the ego. The ego's idea of the special relationship, the image that the Course in Miracles uses is that you imagine a picture frame and this picture frame is very Baroque, and this picture frame is gold, and this picture frame has rubies in it, and this picture frame has diamonds. But the Course in Miracles tells us that those diamonds are our tears, and those rubies are our blood. 
because all we're interested in is the picture frame. What are you looking for in a relationship? What are you looking for? Why don't you write down what you're looking for? Which is the same thing as saying, why don't you design the frame and maybe you can find some poor sucker to fit in? Because the person himself or herself is not what's really important to you. The Course in Miracles says that in the realm of the spirit, in relationship, it's the person that we're interested in. It's the person. And then the frame, you know, the image you get is kind of like one of those Danish things, something Scandinavian, something very simple, something just strong enough to hold the picture up. So the Course in Miracles says what the ego is looking at is the frame. What the ego is looking at is this Baroque frame, but it's not really looking at the picture because we're looking at how can I look at you if what I'm interested in is how you behave or how you make me feel. Well, what if at that moment you, that, the need that you're having is not to behave that way? And the need that you're having is not to make me feel a certain way. And so by definition, as is anything, when it is seen outside of a holy construct, it is going to cause you suffering, it is going to cause me suffering, and it is going to cause both of us to experience, one of us or the other, if not both of us, that obviously this relationship is not working, it is best to separate. So the ego, once again, says that you need to be a certain way, and then not only do I not really, I don't want to see you in your weakness. No, 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 no. I don't want to see your mistakes. No, no, no. I don't want to see that you're not a perfect person. I don't know. Maybe the ego thinks that there must be some perfect person out there, but if they were so perfect, would they want to be with me? I doubt it. But the ego doesn't even want you to look at that. All you know is that you have an idea of how this person should behave. So the Course in Miracles says that you have demands for this person, and you don't, you don't want to behaviorally act them out. You know better than to do that. But basically, you are trying to get the other person to fit into the set of demands that you have because this is your idea of what you quote unquote need in a relationship. Now, the Holy Spirit's construct of relationships is completely opposite. The Course in Miracles says that everything we do and think about on this earth is 180 degrees away from the thinking of the Spirit. Once again, completely upside down. The ego does not want to see your weaknesses because if you're weak, then you can't fit into my picture of what I need in a relationship. And I don't want you to see my weaknesses either. I don't want you to see the real me because if you see the real me, you might reject me. So where's the love, right? And this is when it all gets crazy. And this is when it all gets very, very painful. Now, the spirit is a completely different perspective. This is how the spirit views intimate relationships. Some of you might be aware of the Harville Hendricks work. How many of you know Harville Hendricks books? Harville Hendricks, basically, his philosophy in secular terms is very parallel to what The Course in Miracles talks about spiritually. And that is this notion that, as The Course in Miracles says, relationships are assignments. We are assigned. You know, I love this image of Cupid's arrows. If you see somebody across a crowded room, your eyes meet, and it's so exciting, and it's like, wow. Well, the current thinking about all this is that that's just an illusion. It's just a projection of illusion, and, and reality will ultimately set in. From a course perspective, it's the opposite. That moment, like, whoa, is a spontaneous enlightenment experience. Cupid's bow struck you because how else would you know stop? That's it. There are lessons to be learned here. So what happens is not that that's mutual projection and then reality will set in. What happens is that that's this visit to the mountaintop, but we have a lot of that in this life. Spirit will carry you for this, this we, we've all had these moments in love and in other things where you're placed on the mountaintop just so you can see, but then you have to go back to the bottom because you're going to have to learn to climb there, right? But you have this memory, you, you have this memory that you, you know what it was like. So from a spiritual perspective, when you have this like, oh my God, uh, oh my God, I think I love you. That was not a moment of mutual projection. That was a moment of mutual reality. What's going to happen though, is once I'm with you enough and I see that you're not necessarily a perfect person and my issues come up as well, the mutual projections will set in. Because the mutual projections come from the belief that you are not perfect. And guess what? Because you're a human on this planet, you will probably make mistakes. So the Course in Miracles says that's why the assignment was made. The assignment was made 
because you have maximal growth opportunity with someone who triggers your childhood wounds. The ego's idea of a perfect relationship is someone who does not trigger my childhood wounds, actually allowing me to believe perhaps that they are healed when in fact they are not fully healed. I have just not had them triggered in a while. Therefore, the person who actually, whose behavior will actually trigger, what is the point of the childhood wound? The whole point of the childhood wound is that that's a place where because of something I went through, it might have been childhood, it might have been early adulthood, whatever it was, is a place where it's like the wires get crossed and you go into this emotional muscle spasm. And at that moment, because of something usually that happened in my past, I don't know how to really open up in love and get my needs met. So I get a little nutty there. So if you remind me of that place, I'm gonna go a little nutty. And if uh, my behavior triggers the same in you, you're gonna go a little nutty, which means you aren't fulfilling my pictures. Instead, you are reminding me of my childhood pain, so I'm then thinking this relationship doesn't feel good. I am having the same effect on you, which is perfect for the ego. Once again, its dictate is to seek but do not find. That is the moment when the ego says, obviously, this isn't working. That is the moment when you're saying, oh, this is so terrible. But God himself is saying, oh, this is good. This is really, really good. Because you are being forced to see your own limits to your capacity to love. So the fact that something brings up the childhood wound or any wound does not of itself mean it's wrong. Because in The Course in Miracles, the whole notion of the holy relationship is the idea that that's the purpose of the relationship. It's a kind of hospital for the soul. The Course in Miracles says relationships are the laboratories of the Holy Spirit. The Course in Miracles says that in the presence of the deepest love, the other person's wounds will be brought up and your wounds will be brought up, not immediately, because everybody's gonna be able to retain the illusions long enough. But on the other hand, it's not an illusion to think that the other person is perfect. You actually weren't wrong to think that the other person is, it, it, um, um, it is innocent. In that moment of the spontaneous enlightenment experience, when you saw through to the innocence of that person, that was not the illusion. But because all of us, because all of us have been trained into the mindset of the ego, when I see you behave in certain ways that do not represent my idea of perfection, because I have been trained to focus on your body and your body's behavior rather than to pierce the veil of illusion and see truth the, through to the innocent in you no matter what, I will then find you guilty when in fact you are just human. In the holy relationship, we understand that this is what's going on. In the holy relationship, we are very, very clear. It's going to happen. You are going to show me where your stuff is, and I am going to show you where my stuff is. And if we do not see this in a sacred context and do not recognize the spiritual purpose and meaning of all this, then we're both going to be in trouble. You're going to be hurt. I'm going to be hurt. The ego is going to separate us. It might be that our bodies separate. It might be that our bodies don't separate. We might get married. We might live together for the next 50 years. But that doesn't mean we're necessarily together. The Course in Miracles points out what we all know. Two bodies being together doesn't mean the two hearts are together. And two bodies being, being separated doesn't mean that the, that the hearts are not together. The Course in Miracles says relationships are of the mind. Now. What the ego mind has done is it said that the spiritual, the spiritual practice of life, the path of, of love, the path of seeing all things in a sacred context is one category. But then over here is health and well-being. Over here is career and money. Over here is politics. Over here is, is romance and intimate relationship. It set up all these categories, you see. The categorization is the ego mind because in spirit there is no division, there is no disunity, there is no separate categorization or complexity. So that's a way that the ego mind says, keep your search for God over here. But God isn't what it's about when you're talking about your career and money. 
Spirit isn't what it's about when you're talking about your health. Spirit isn't what it's about when you're talking about politics. Spirit isn't what it's about when you're talking about romance and sex and all of that, which is the way to make sure if something is not about your spirit, since your spirit is who you are. That's the same thing as saying, good luck being within that situation without yourself. If I go into any situation without my recognition, without my remembrance, without my not only understanding but experience of the fullness of myself, then I am fractured. So my oneness with God, remember, your oneness with God is your completion. Your oneness with God means your realization that you are part of a large field of infinite possibility. Remember, in any situation, in any relationship, and the Course in Miracles says that all situations are relationships, your power lies in knowing who you are and why you're here. So the ego mind and love and intimacy, it's not even asking why I'm here, never puts any demands on me. It's never like, what am I not giving? The Course in Miracles says the only thing that can be lacking in any situation is what you are not giving. But in the ego mind, it's, no, how are you doing? How are you doing? I'm in constant judgment to see if you are giving me what I need. You go into people who actually pay to ask you, is this relationship really giving you everything you need? And how many times are you asked, are you giving everything that you have? Because the ground of your being in God is not that your purpose is to go out there and get everything you could possibly want. That's not the spiritual function of life. The spiritual function of life is to recognize that we are beings of God, as is everyone else. The Course in Miracles says all of the children of God are special and none of the children of God are special. Every single person that we meet is loved infinitely. We are loved infinitely. The Course in Miracles says the purpose of our lives is to learn to think as God thinks. The Course in Miracles says you think you're going to try to understand a person in order to decide whether or not they are worthy of your love. But the Course in Miracles says, until you understand them, you, excuse me, I'm sorry. The Course in Miracles says, you are going to try to understand someone to decide whether or not they're worthy of your love. But the Course says, until you love them, you cannot understand them. So we're constantly putting each other on trial and we're constantly auditioning each other. But it's a total no win for everyone involved. If you go into the relationship and you ask only, may this, may this happen only if it is the will of God that it happened. Now, this gets really, really tricky, obviously, when you bring sex into the mix. Because in sex, for all kinds of reasons, it is kind of easier to get to that enlightened place. Now, what the ego mind says is, if we have sex, if we join our bodies, then we will get more intimate. The truth of the matter is you will get more intimate during that act than its aftermath. But if we do not have the personality construct to contain all that enlightenment, that's the thing. It's not that when you had that great night, it wasn't an enlightenment experience. It actually was. However, the issue is, you know, like that song, Carol King, Will You Still Love Me Tomorrow? The issue is if we don't have the personality construct to be able to hold that much light the following day. And that's why casual sex is very, very dangerous. Casual sex is the ego saying that if we have sex, it will get us closer. But in the hands of the ego, what casual sex will actually do, because if you think about it, this makes sense. If I'm casual with your, if, with your body, it makes sense that I will probably be casual with your heart. If you, if, if you are casual with my body, why should I expect you to not be casual with my heart? But at that time, and it's not even that it's an illusion, it's just a lack of wisdom to think that the fact that you have this, ca this concern for my heart during that experience means that you will necessarily have the personality container after that experience to hold that much light. And so from a Course in Miracles perspective, this can only be expected like with every other situation in life where you go into the situation without the remembrance of who you are and why you're here. When you see it as a spiritual experience, whether it is your work life, your career, your romances, we don't cut God out of anything. And you know the irony, of course, is that the ego mind would say, well, you know, going into the whole sexual romantic thing, seeing it as like sacred, like <laughs> that's not very sexy. Actually, what's so sexy 
about one night of pleasure followed by six months of agony. So really, what ultimately is sexy? Rather, in the hands of the Holy Spirit, the idea of sex would not be a substitute for communication, because that's what the ego really wants to do. The ego wants to join the body, and then you have this feeling that if we've joined the body, then we're intimate. The ego wants us to believe that, because it knows that that will actually put us into insanity, because it's not really true, because relationship is of the mind. So rather, in the hands of the Holy Spirit, the issue of, of sex is that it would be a deepening of the communication, that the communication was already so deep that the body sort of took it from there. So the holy relationship in the hands of the Holy Spirit, and the Course in Miracles says that all relationships have some aspect of specialness. You can't say, I'm looking for a holy relationship, I'm looking for a holy relationship. Because until we're at the level of enlightened master, any relationship we have is going to have some aspect of specialness. But we can learn the point. The point being that particularly if you meet somebody who is very exciting to you, you say right then, you pray first. You know, that's the issue and everything. These are the techniques. These are the, the tools in our problem-solving repertoire, as the Course in Miracles calls them. The moment you see somebody that you absolutely adore, or even if you didn't just see them and you absolutely adore them, pray right away, dear God. You know as well as I do, I can be more neurotic in this situation than in any other. Why? Because the ego loves this one. Dear God, save me. Because if left to my own devices, I will probably not realize it, but I will blow it in every possible way. In, in, even though I will not see it while I'm doing it, I'm going to make this poor person in front of me. I'll put them on trial all the time. Audition them all the time. Make a list all the time of where they did it wrong and where they did it right. See whether or not they are good enough, whether they are fulfilling my needs, whether or not they are giving me what I think that I deserve. Onward and onward and onward and onward. The hands of the Holy Spirit, it is understood by both people. Look, your stuff's going to come up and my stuff's going to come up. You know, one of the things we see in politics is that everybody's so good in their concession speeches. One of the things you see in relationships is everybody's so good once the relationship is over and you're doing the autopsy. Well, what I really wanted and what you really wanted, and then, like, then you get real about what was really going on, but you weren't able to be that real while it was going on, and sometimes you don't even realize that's when intimacy happened, because intimacy is that we got really honest. What I really wanted was, what I really wanted was, what I really thought during that time when that happened was, and you find yourself in all these honest relationships, all these honest conversations, and that's when it was real because it came from an authentic ground of being. But while you were in the relationship, you didn't even feel safe to be in that authentic ground of being, and you probably weren't safe to be in that authentic ground of being. Neither were you creating a safe space for the other person to be in theirs. And so the Course in Miracles gives us a radical mental restructuring of everything. And we put ourselves in, in God's hands. We think of God as a kind of mystical third. Now, first of all, we realize God, Holy Spirit, is that which brought us to that person. Remember, the relationship was an assignment. All relationships are assignments made by the Holy Spirit, the Course in Miracles says, because the universe itself is intentional. All that's going on in this world is that we are being challenged and invited into the space of our most evolved self. And so every relationship gives us this challenge and every relationship gives us this opportunity. But once again, the idea that I am here in order to be at one with God, in order to be at one with God, now, some people say, well, I want a person who wants to pray with me. I want a person who wants to meditate with me. I want a person who wants to do this spiritual retreat with me. When really the Course would say, why don't you try being someone who lets this poor person be where they want to be and do what they want to do? Because even you're using God as a way to lord your beliefs over the other person. Are you with me? All the different ways we come up with, I just want to have a spiritual relationship, right? I just want to have a spiritual relationship. If he or she would go with me to this retreat, I think we could get somewhere. Right? When really the spiritual work, we are not here, the Course says, to monitor another person's process. We are here to monitor our own. And that means radical permission for people to be who they want to be. Now, some people would say, oh my God, there are no boundaries in this at all. All right, now let's talk about that. 
The Course in Miracles points out that the warden can't leave the prison any more than the prisoner can. So if I have this idea of where you should be and how you should be and where you should go and all that stuff, then if you do not live up to my ideas of how you should be, then this will make me upset and angry. And then I will have to set boundaries, which you will either accept or you will not. If you accept and you acquiesce, the relationship is still busted because you're there from a, from a position of needing to be there rather than really wanting to be there. Or I will move on. Or you will move on. But if I move on or you move on, that same drama is going to be enacted. If, on the other hand, I say, in my mind, my only job here is to love you as you are. My only job here is to totally permit you to be who you are. My, that's what it means to walk to God together. My only job is to love you, and no matter what you do, to know that my function on this earth is to forgive you. That puts me in the ground of my true being. And guess what? In the ground of your true being, you are more than capable of saying, no, I'm not interested. In the ground of your true being, that's where you are able to own your yes and own your no. It doesn't make you vulnerable to staying in situations where you shouldn't be, quite the opposite. It's the only place where you're safe to be because it's the place where you are in touch with your gut, you realize the Holy Spirit works through your subconscious, works through your gut, and then you're not angry, you're just out of here. There is no boundary even that has to be set. I don't belong here. That's all it is. It's not judgmental. It's not demanding. It's not anything. It's simply stated from a place of non-reactivity. And so this idea that you ever have to worry that God will make you a doormat. We do that in love like we do it everywhere else. Oh, well, this forgiveness self will just make you a total doormat. The Course in Miracles points out what all of us are willing to see if we will take a brutally honest look. Your ego is what makes you a doormat. The fact that you left in anger, that was really the pathetic thing. Not that you, you know, it's not, we say, well, it's pathetic if you stay too long. Well, it's pathetic if you storm out of the room angry as well. Because both signify a person who is not in the truth of their honest being. Now, sometimes people say, we all say, well, I totally am into this, but see, they're not. But it doesn't really work that way. The Course in Miracles says, whoever is saner at the time. And sometimes somebody who is who is into this stuff in terms of their head may or may not be someone who can practice it with you as much as you might. Some of, definitely I know in my life, some of my greatest Course in Miracles teachers have never even heard of A Course in Miracles. Because this is not about, you know, The Course in Miracles says none of this is about belief, it's about experience. So I want you to think of some of the ways that you are at the behest of the ego's thinking rather than realizing that love and romance, like everything else, are a hospital, a hospital of the soul. We understand your stuff's going to come up and my stuff's going to come up. If you know that in advance, you're not so horrified. If you know that in advance, I had a man actually say to me once, you're like a needy therapist. Oh, that's sweet. Right? But I had to face, I, can to I could totally see why I was coming across that way. And then you can laugh about it. You don't have to you go like, well, that's, you, you own more of your own stuff. We're so big in relationships of saying, well, it's what he's not doing right or what she's not doing right. But once we own that my job is to forgive this person no, and to recognize the innocence in this person no matter what. Then whereas when they make a mistake, remember, the Course in Miracles says that the ego mind is like a scavenger dog. It is always looking for any scrap of evidence that your brother did wrong. See what she did? See what he did? I couldn't stand it when she did that. I couldn't stand it when he did that. Right? So the ego mind makes a list of all the things that your brother did wrong, which is a reason to reject them and a reason to cast them from your heart. And then you can say, I cannot find love. Right? Of course, in Miracle says that if instead you realize, if my brother is showing me their quote unquote mistake, one of two things is happening. Either it's not a mistake at all, it's who they are. And the mistake here is that you are taking the attitude that they should be different. That's number one. Or number two, it is a mistake because they, like you, are triggered by their childhood wounds. And still, this isn't about them, it's about you. Can you be the space of quote unquote Christ love, Buddha love, God love, Shekinah love? Now, the ego mind would say, oh, this is about 
you know, my marriage. This is about my dating. This has nothing to do with God. But that's where we go anytime we forget that everything is about God. That I can be a space where you have radical permission to be who you are. Now, that doesn't mean radical permission to be who you are and I'm going to necessarily want to continue living with you. It doesn't mean radical permission to be who you are and I'm going to necessarily want to have sex with you. It doesn't mean radical permission to be who you are and I want to necessarily be married to you. It is radical permission to be who you are, knowing that my capacity to find that place within myself where you have radical permission to be yourself is the place where I am one with God. And that's the point at which I am manifesting my true being. Now, two things are going to happen there. Number one, you are going to become your better self in the presence of that radical permission. Think about it. Who do you act your best around? Someone who is monitoring you and scolding you and whose very energy says you better be this way, you better be that way? or someone who allows you to be who you are. And someone who allows you to be who you are and expects the best in you is someone in whose presence you might go through all that stuff for a while, but you are more likely to the ri rise to the best. You know, an intimate relationship, that means by definition you're going to see a person up close. You're going to see where they're hurt. You're going to see where they can't deal. And that person is going to bring out, I mean, we've all been there. I mean, it's, it's sad. You act your worst around people you care about the most sometimes. If you could only be cool with them the way you're cool with other people, you don't even care about so much. But that's the purpose of the relationship is that it will bring these things up. So the Course in Miracles tells us, stop doing this to people. You're doing this to people in the name of love. You're doing this to people because you, what you're saying, what you are actually believing is, because I want to have a relationship. That's why I want this, because I'm trying, I'm trying to have a, so that we could have a relationship. I mean, who among us doesn't do that in one way or the other? But really, it's how we kill relationship. But we are so afraid. You know, we're all addicts and we're all avoidance in certain parts of our, of, our, uh, of, of our consciousness. We are addicted to love in that we are addicted to this romantic notion because we have been fed this idea that there is one special person out there who will complete us. But we're all avoidance in a way as well because the idea of God, the idea of the totality of God's love is overwhelming to the ego. The ego is afraid of it. The ego is afraid of it. Why? Because complete surrender into the love of God is the death of the ego. So we're avoidance in that I'm afraid that if I let this person in, I will be engulfed. The other person is saying, although it's really the more addictive behavior, it's really coming from an avoidant place of I'm afraid if I forgive this person completely that I will be engulfed. And what will be engulfed is your sense of separate self. What will be engulfed is your, is, is your ego personification. You know, this thing of en enmeshment and this thing of codependency has gotten so out of control these days. There is such a thing as enmeshment, and there is such a thing as codependency. But to hear the ego talk about it, I heard somebody the other day actually say, I can't remember where it was, that somebody had a real codependent relationship with their eight-year-old. <laughs> That's not codependency, that's parenthood, <laughs> right? With this real, because that's what the ego is. The ego has any distrust of deep love. So sometimes you see things that are actually deep love these days. People are too quick to call it enmeshment or too quick to call it codependency when not necessarily, even though those, those things obviously do exist. And so let's all take this moment and just to think about how much we've all bought into this idea that there's that one special person out there. And even if you think you have found that one special person, and it's not like the Course in Miracles does not make assignments that are extraordinary, where you feel that someone is your twin flame or you feel that someone is your, is, is your partner in this lifetime, those things do exist. And they are the great, some of the greatest gifts that we can have in a lifetime. However, when we bring to that experience, and that's the art of love, that I can love you this much, that I can be that thrilled by your being in my presence, but absolutely have complete permission to you not to be in my presence. That's the art of love. And you having complete permission to not be in my presence is what will pave the way for you to want to be. 
And that's sophisticated stuff. That's big stuff. So sometimes we say, well, this person has a relationship because the bodies are together. And I can't tell you how many people I have known, and we all have, where the bodies might have been together for decades, but these people were so not together. And quite the opposite. So think about all the ways, whether you are quote unquote in a relationship or not, where you have been fed this bill of goods, which we've all been fed, and we are at the effect of this idolatry, because that's what it is. It makes the other person your idol. You see the other person as God. You see the other person as a source of your good. You see the other person as the source of your happiness. You see the other person's behavior as the source of your sense of completion. All idols fall. Only God is the source of our completion. In fact, as somebody pointed out to me, it's not like only God can fill that hole. There is no hole. You are complete already. And when we make it in our own thinking, you know, that, that's how our, you know, we change our attitudinal musculars, musculature. You can't think yourself into a, into a together body. You have to do the exercises. You have to actually lift the weights. And it's the same with enlightened attitudes. You can't just intellectually shift. We have to work this stuff. And when it comes to sexual and romantic love, it's hard. It takes practice, but you can start practicing these principles. First and foremost, like I said, if you're in love or you want to be in love or whatever, don't leave God out. The Course in Miracles makes it clear that the Holy Spirit is who makes the assignment. And then there's beautiful material in the, in the text of the Course where it says, is it reasonable to assume that the spirit that brought you together is not there now to take the relationship under his control and make sure that you go through the holization process. And it's not always going to be easy. But my point is that the fact that it's difficult sometimes in a romantic relationship doesn't mean that something is wrong. It means that this, the stuff has to come up in order to be released. In every area of life, we heal through a kind of detox. But when the ego mind says, because I've seen their stuff, or uh, they've seen my stuff, or our stuff met, the Course in Miracles says the ego is going to tell you now to reject each other. And then the Course in Miracles does what I don't know if it does anywhere else in the Course, actually. If it does, it would be in the workbook, which is different when the prayers. I think it's the only place in the text where it actually puts in italics, hear not this now because your ego is going to be screaming, this is awful, this is over, and in everything in life, including what we're going through as a country. Sometimes it's when things are so, there's so much tumult and there's so much drama, this is when there's an opportunity. All crisis, including in romantic relationships, is an invitation to rise to the occasion. So I think sometimes when it comes, I, I, I think, I read somewhere, I can't remember where it was, I read somewhere about this couple that had been together for many decades, and somebody said to them, I think it was the man, said to the man, what was the secret, what's the key, what would you say to younger people? And he said, be kinder to each other. And I've noticed that. I've noticed that in my own behavior, and I've noticed that in, behave, that in behavior towards me, that sometimes it's when we love each other the most, we're not as kind as we should be. And that is part of the price that we paid. And I know from this, because I'm the generation that introduced all this, over-casualization. We've become overly casual as a society. We, we, formality has its place, because formality, talk about boundaries, that's formality is the healthy boundary. It means that, that you remain within a context where you're not so likely to spew it and to say whatever you think and to think it's cool because it's honest and what you really, it really meant without considering whether or not it was kind, et cetera. Particularly because if you know somebody deeply, you have, you, you, you have the capacity to really get them where they live. So you want to be very kind. And that's why the idea of formality has its place. Because if you were not respecting those boundaries of formality, then there are no boundaries that then you try to set after everything's already been spewed and dropped out of the bag. So that's why the over-casualization of sex, the over-casualization of intimacy, all of that is not what it appears to be. It is a trick of the mind. It is a trick of the ego. And even though while we're doing it, it feels like this is how we are building love, 
too often. That is how we are destroying it and undermining it. Now, there are people and there are situations where, for whatever reason, that stuff works, and people were together that one night, and then it lasts for the rest of their life. Those beautiful moments occur. But as general, as general principle, the Course in Miracles tells us that once we realize that the Holy Spirit has made an assignment and that that's what this relationship is, then you will understand that people's hurt will be exposed and your hurt will be exposed. Be very careful. Make forgiveness your main assignment because only if you have infinite compassion for each other, only if you have infinite forgiveness of each other will you remain in the sacred space where the relationship can actually be built and move forward. It will not always feel good necessarily, but it's like any other situation in life where you're growing. Sometimes the stuff is coming up in order to be released. And then we know what real intimacy is. And that means that we are able to live from a more authentic place, be more honest with each other. That's why, like I said, sometimes it's only in the autopsy, at the end of the relationship, where we get real honest about what really happened. Sometimes there's more intimacy when the relationship is over than when the relationship was going on. Because our intimacy, real intimacy, was actually stymied during the relationship because it was seen through this filter of how it ought to be and what it ought to feel like. Intimacy, there is no intimacy without real, deep, honest communication. And if that seems seems unsexy for a moment, it will be even sexier later because it will enable us to know each other at that deepest level and that deeper ground of our being. That's ultimately the only wellspring of heat It's ultimately the only wellspring of of our own genuine power, our own capacity to re-green ourselves, to become better people. And that's ultimately the greatest gift we have to give to a lover. It's the greatest gift we have to give to our society. It's the greatest gift we have to give to life. Hey, I'm better today than I was yesterday. That's it. That's, That's what life is about. Hey, I can show up more today than I was able to yesterday. And when you can look at another person and know that despite what we went through, Partly because of what I learned from getting it wrong with you, now I know how to get it right, and thank you for showing me that, and I really appreciate you forgiving me, and I'm going to forgive you for where you did that too. Not only is it so beautiful, it's very, very beautiful when I love you and I see your beauty, but I have never seen your darkness, so it's easy for me to see your beauty. What's really profound in life is, oh, I've seen you at your worst, baby. I still think you're so hot. I still think you're so beautiful. Because until you've seen someone's darkness, you don't really know who they are. And until you have forgiven somebody's darkness, you don't really know what love is. In this area, like in every other area of life, The Course in Miracles says, the thinking of the world is 180 degrees away from the thinking of God. But remember, the thinking of the world is not necessarily what it appears to be. It is the path to hell, hell not being something after we die, but the anxiety that we feel right while we're in the experience. Heaven is the awareness of our oneness. And that is a spiritual concept. You are my brother. You are my sister. You are my holy companion on this earth. It might not seem it at the time, but in time, that's really hot. Okay. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. So now we will do our meditation in this and in everything we ever do here. I'm like the aerobics instructor. I'm going through these moves with you so I can stay in shape, but I can't do it for you. So that means that in your own relationships, your own thoughts, this is where you, we all bring it up and put it on the altar. The altar is in your own mind. And this is where you have the opportunity to look at some of your own mental filters some of your own behavior, some of the ways that maybe you can see and you just couldn't see it at the time because we don't see it at the time. I mean, none of us wake up in the morning, you know, oh, I think I'll be a jerk today. None of us wake up in the morning, oh, I think I'll just completely sabotage my relationship today. Oh, I think I'll wake up in the morning and completely condemn everything the poor sucker does today. Oh, I think I'll wake up today and do the, you know, act out in the ways that are sure to drive love away. This is all going on. We are at the behest of the ego mind. And if we do not proactively fill your mental house, i.e. your mind, with light, there will be darkness. 
what that means is that if we don't proactively surrender a situation to God, then the mental energy that would have been used for that purpose is used instead for the purposes of neurosis and pathology and separation. So that's why with your intimate relationships, just like with every other relationship, you wake up in the morning, you say, dear God, may I be a space of possibility for that person. May I be someone in whose presence that person feels more permitted to be who they are, more loved and approved of as they are. May there be something about my interaction with that person that makes them feel better about themselves. You know, um, hold on, there was a situation I, I wanted to, I, I'm trying to remember exactly how it went down. Um, oh, it was many, many years ago, and a man that I'd been with, and I said, and he was with someone else, and I said, well, you know, the only reason you like her is because she tells you how great you are all the time. And he responded, yeah, I think that has something to do with it. <laughs> I mean, that's pretty sick thinking. Oh, she just makes you feel great all the time. <laughs> Why are you here with me where it's so awful every single day? <laughs> Right, you get the drift. <clears throat> Let's meditate. And so it is that closing the outer eye, we now open to the light which is within. Entering now into the sacred space within our mind the place where all is true and all is real. First, we call to mind any person, perhaps someone we are with, someone we were with, a past lover, a present lover, maybe not a lover, but somebody, you know who they are. Whoever is, whoever's face is in front of you, that is the one. And now, within your own mind, bow in spirit before this person. This namaste consciousness, this salute from the love in you to the love in them. And now, in this moment, think of all the ways that you have bound this person, at least in your thinking, to judgments, to ideas of how you think that they should have been or should be. See all the ways you have tried to emotionally or psychologically entrap them how you have judged them, how you have even subtly put them down or made them feel worse about themselves. Own these mistakes. Atone for these mistakes within your heart. Acknowledge to yourself your own insanity in those moments. And from the deepest part of you, say to the deepest part of that person that you are sorry. From your spirit to theirs, now offer an apology. ask for their forgiveness. Own before God that you recognize your mistake, <clears throat> that you yourself were the mental or emotional slave driver. Atone for your error and pray for divine correction. And now we ask God to show us 
how to love well. Dear God, reveal to us the art of love. We place in God's hands our relationship to anyone who fills our mind at this moment with whom we know there is a special attachment. We give this relationship to God and we pray that it be lifted to the level of divine right order. May our relationship with this person be lifted above and beyond the walls that would divide us, the shadows that separate us, the perception of each other's guilt that keeps love at bay. Rather, dear God, may a great wave of forgiveness come upon us both, that through your vision we might pierce the veil of illusion, bypass the perception of guilt in ourselves or in each other, and see through the veil to the radiant eternal innocence that is the truth within us both. We pray now to see the radiant, illumined truth of this other person, the light that shines outward from their heart into infinity, beyond their body and beyond their behavior. And now may we feel that same love of God within us, extending from deep within us, outward beyond the body into infinity. And now allow yourself to experience the infinite love that they are, merging with the infinite light that you are. Their body now melting in your perception before the radiance of this light. Your body melting in your perception before the radiance of this light. and now experience this place where the light in you and the light in them, the light of you and the light of them is one light. And you are one beyond the body, beyond guilt, beyond mistakes, beyond time. Whether this person is sister or brother, lover, friend, child, parent, employee, employer, colleague, associate, someone you like, someone you love, someone you dislike or even hate, This is the truth, the oneness we share. The Son of God, all of us are. Relax into this knowing. Allow your mind, your heart to embrace its truth. Where there is no stress, for there is no body. Where there is no pain, for there is no guilt. Where there is no sorrow, for there is no time. And now once more, 
as this person stands before you. Bow to them. There is a very good chance that you will see them now bow to you. May this power be imprinted upon our minds and our relationships blessed hereby. And so it is. We all say, Amen. Okay. Now let's talk about anything you want to talk about. Uh, let, uh, let's do this first. Why don't we stay, for those of you specifically who have relationship questions that you want to um, ask based on tonight's lecture, let's do that first. Does anybody have anything because we're already in that conversation? Okay, going in the back there. Yes, sir. Now that's a comment. So thank you for tonight. My question is, I get that when you're in a relationship and you, you're, you feel triggered, it's a divine assignment, so that makes sense. But in the moment sometimes, I feel, when I'm triggered, I feel angry. So obviously I'm not in my Christ self, it's all mad, and I'm not <laughs> at peace. And I, and I say, stop, it's like my, my boundary. But how do you get in your, I guess in your, your right mind okay. and have the boundary <clears throat> and not be the doormat, but also be, yeah, be in your right mind. Also, additionally, how can the other person not feel attacked when you, even if you're in your right mind, go like, stop doing that, Marianne, you're, you're being annoying. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard it a few times. <clears throat> okay, so this is the deal. You know, we talk about how you do physical exercise so you can move. You do spirit, spiritual exercise so that you can remain still. That is why you meditate. That is why you pray. So that you form, you can stay in your stillness, which is your quote unquote non-reactive place. Now in an intimate relationship, because it's intimate, because that person knows how to sort of get to you in your gut, if ever there is a situation where you want to practice the art of stillness, it's there. Intimate relationship is a high assignment. And Sometimes, you know, look how the ego operates. Everything's so good, I don't need to meditate, <laughs> right? Everything's going so well, I don't really need to pray or meditate. But remember, the ego mind is always on its, you know, will do everything that it can. So intimate relationship is a very intense learning assignment. So that stuff will always be going on. Now, remember what I said before about how honesty without compassion is brutality. When I was talking about the issue of formality, the issue of kindness. Also, I think that Pat Allen, the psychologist in um, Los Angeles, is absolutely correct that men are actually more sensitive than women. Women, we think that men are more tough because they're rough with their bodies, but we are more rough with our words. And a man experiences our tough words the way we experience their rough or tough physicality. Does that make sense? So just like guys will kind of like rough each other up and it's just kind of like, hey, you know, it's no big deal. It's kind of like this thing they do. Whereas to us, we go, oh my goodness, you touched me, right? Whereas with men, it's different. You and I might bitch at each other and go blah, 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 and then say, okay, you want to go shopping now? <laughs> Whereas with a man, I go, oh, you want to go shopping? How can you say we're going to shop after that conversation we had last night? You're like, what? That we were just talking, right? <laughs> right? So this goes back to what I was saying about formality. Be very, very careful. Be very, very careful what you say. And intimacy can make us relax too much. You know, don't, you know, I, that's, I think, this goes back to what I was talking about, the over-casualization. And we lose the mystery of love when you do that as well. This goes back into what I was saying before. We squeeze it all into sex and we just want it to happen there. It has to be something we cultivate all day. It's like, when do you release a man? Every morning. When are you kind and fantastic all day to the best of your ability? And we have so over-casualized. You know, I remember a lot of things with my parents, things of my mother's behavior that I laughed at for decades and then look back on and realize how good she was and how she kept such a 
with such a guy, right? Because she was, she never, she was never overly casual with her dress, with her home, even with her behavior. And I noticed when my father, my father called my mother sweetheart. I never heard him call her Sophie Ann, except when she hit a point. It's so interesting because he would just call her sweetheart, sweetheart. But if my mother was about to cross some boundary, you know how you knew? Sophie Ann. <laughs> and she knew, she, and I saw her, she was careful as well. And the, the, these are some of the ways in which we are far too, we just let it rip in ways that we, that, that, that later, the person remembers. And what I was saying before about if you had meditated that day, if I have meditated in the morning, I have a different, whether it's the lessons of the Course in Miracles or Transcendental Meditation, whatever your serious meditation practice is, you have a different nervous system throughout the day. I'm not saying that you'll be an enlightened master and you won't make any mistakes, but the chances of you radically falling off the cliff are greatly diminished. What does it mean to fall off the cliff? To say something that like, that's it, he's out of here, or that's it, she's not gonna forget that you said that. And this is exactly what I mean. We, this is very, the ego mind will do everything possible if you are not in control of your house. If you, and what does it mean to be in control of your house? That, that means really the master of your own mind because so much subconscious childhood stuff is brought up by intimate love that if you are not cre placing it in God's hands in a sacred container, then your reactivity and the other person's reactivity, it's all over the place. And that's what we do in our world. We, we, we don't, we're not careful. Does that make sense? And also, look at your career. It doesn't just happen. You have to tend it. And you have to show up every day. Look at your car. More people in our society today, there are people who spend more time and effort taking care of their car than taking care of their love and taking care of their relationship. Uh, in, 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 in work, in, in your career, if you have a serious career, you can't just do whatever you want, whenever you want it, and say whatever you want, whenever you want it. That's just not how to be, that's not a serious player. And that's not a serious player at love either. Does that make sense? And we don't take our loves seriously, except in the sense of what we want it to give to us. Does that make sense? Does that answer your question, sir? Yep, I okay. feel a little ashamed. Pardon? <laughs> I feel, yeah, I feel, uh, like I have some work to do. Yeah, we all have work to do. And also, not only do we all have work to do, but it is work, it's like physical exercise. You, you never get to stop doing the work, and it must be tended to every day. You might have a Bentley, you might have a Rolls Royce, but you're gonna have to put gas in the car. And, you, and, and by the way, yes, absolutely, a Rolls Royce or a Bentley is going to take more maintenance effort than a Honda is. Well, same with a relationship. The fact that the relationship is high maintenance, it's a Bentley. It's roles, right? So the fact that a relationship, this is not necessarily something bad, that you are called to something. Does that make sense? Okay, who's next? Yes, this lady right here. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, this pertains to two things. One would start probably with the phrase irreconcilable differences. Uh -huh. and. Something that you said then in the sermon, which really made me curious about how the Course would address, um, you said, you know, there'll be a moment when you sit in the oneness of God in which it doesn't mean you're going to stay. Which means what, ma'am? It doesn't mean you're going to stay. That's right. It doesn't, it doesn't necessarily mean, mean you're going to stay. You're going to go. So the question that's raised for me was, how interesting then I... It hadn't crossed my mind to go. It crossed my mind that at this peak of agony, it's a good time to dive deep into this now and move beyond if we can. I bet we can. And uh, my partner has said, you know, no, no, I don't think so. I think uh, I'm feeling pretty calm and I'm done. And so, Irreconcilable difference suddenly became a phrase of tremendous import to me because I think we both felt like we were pretty clear with God right about then, you know. But so I, I wonder what your so you so are. your feeling was that now that we had been through this, we can really do it. 
his feeling now that we've been through this, we got, we're leaving. Um, I've been, uh, once you reach a certain age, no matter what the drama, you've played every part. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> so I, I think everybody in this room understands what you were saying. Because sometimes we do feel like, well, now that we know all this, now we could really do it. But that's if you have this construct. So it all has to do with the mental construct. Because the truth of the matter is, whether you are to stay or to go, getting to that moment is what's imperative. And to some people, that would be the sign. Now we could probably do it to another person. Not. And the thing is, you, you can't make another person's choice for them. Now, if you are both prayerful and you are asking that God's will be done, there's a chance. You know, the Course in Miracles says that it's, it doesn't use this expression, but it presents a construct of a win-win universe. If it's right for one, it's right for the other. Now, the Course in Miracles does say that people are brought together for as long a period of time as physical proximity serves the, the, the maximal soul growth opportunity. The Course in Miracles says relationships are never over. So when you felt like we could really do it now and your partner felt like, no, I'm calm, but I, I want out now, the Course in Miracles says the relationship was not over at that point. The relationship changed form. So the universe is, because relationships are of the mind, so the universe is intentional. The self-actualization of all people is the goal of the universe. So the same lessons will be learned. You, both of you are going to take up where you left off, one way or the other. There are, in God, actually, no irreconcilable differences. But even then, I mean, that's kind of a legal term. It's used with divorces and stuff. But you want to get to the point of complete forgiveness, whether the issue is to go or to stay, because that's the only way to be able to go forward free to love again. Does that make sense? Wonderful sense, thanks. Anybody else who's next? Yes, ma'am. I have been beginning the course, and I need to... Uh, oh, thank, oh, hi. Uh, I, oh, my God, I can't wait to do that without the speaker. You're really... Um, your work tonight was transformational, and um, thinking about forgiveness has been the perfect topic for me because I'm going through a very hard time with something just happened two months ago about someone who lied to me and uh, came back into my life and told me he met someone else after he got divorced when we were together. And I've been battling how to forgive someone who I loved and trusted, and I don't know who they are. And I loved what you said about how that you're triggered from your childhood, and then that makes you realize how vulnerable you are. And I lost my center and didn't handle it the way I would have liked to have handled it. So I'm following the course on okay, that Okay, so I'm a little, I, uh, you lost me a little bit. Mm -hmm. This person lied to you? This person and I broke up under certain conditions and now he has moved on and met someone else and didn't come back to me and tell me as he had promised to do. Okay, hold on. You were with him, mm -hmm. he moved on, you, you broke up. Mm -hmm. He met someone else. Mm -hmm. And then what? He had promised that he would come and tell me if his life changed, oh. and he didn't. But not. you had already broken up, I thought. Yes, but I'm devastated because I didn't get over him. Because you're not I over did him. not get over him. You would not get over him, and he's moved on. That's right. You realize how common this is? Very. Yeah. <laughs> Except that it was four years, and I should have been over it. I was over it till I found out something that I didn't know. My dad died, and I had a reversal, so. So you've been, you were with this man for how long? On and off for about, well, I knew him for 10 years. We were together for six. Okay, you were together for six years, and now it's four years on. Later, right. And you feel that you have not completely moved on. Unfortunately. Okay. So have you, do you feel that you have forgiven him completely? Not yet. Okay, and what is obstructing your capacity to forgive him completely? Um, jealousy and anger and more sort of like I wasn't given a chance, that kind of thing. Jealousy and anger and yeah. what? That I felt I was not given the chance to have a proper relationship with him. Okay, so your job, despite the pain. Well, there's a lot of that. May he be blessed, may he be happy, may he be loved. I'm working on that. Make it, no, no you're not working on it. I gotta do but it. But you yeah, will work on it, now that I said it. Yeah, yeah. Hopefully. May he be blessed, may he be happy, may he be loved. Because what you really want is for him to be happy with me. Obviously. 
I just Th saw him last night. It didn't not, go well. That's not God love. No, it's not. If I really love you, I love, and, and I'm not saying it's easy. Um, I think in my book, Illuminata, there's the prayer for the heartbroken, something like Which that. Book Maybe, is this? Caitlin, Sorry, would you please get Illuminata? I think there's the prayer for the heartbroken, something like that. So basically, what you're saying, and this is exactly what the Course is saying, you're thinking this, this person, and I'm not saying this glibly, like it's easy. Oh, no, I'm Okay? Really but look at what's happening here. What I'm really saying is I want this person to be happy with me, which is not saying I just want this person to be happy. <laughs> it's not saying I just want this person to be on the path that would make them happy and blessed, and, and if she can bring him more happiness than I can, may he be with her. <laughs> but this what you got it, that's why you got to put your mind. It's just like picking up weights, right? Because you got to counter gravity. But you see the gap between your thinking, do you see the prayer for the heartbroken? Oh, wow. Okay. Can I have a spoke. A prayer for a broken relationship, obsession and addiction and love. Perfect. <laughs> it's all here. Uh, I think prayer for a broken relationship. It. Hold on. <laughs> see, I did all this research for you. <laughs> Thank you. Obviously. Well, this is I one that I thought, hold on. Oh, thank you. I want to look at your book now. Okay, hold on. You want to read this out loud? Sure. I have my glasses okay. on. Read it so everybody can understand. Where am I reading it? it? Own your words. Dear God. Uh, I'm sorry, hold on just a moment. Dear God, in releasing this man. It's a man, I assume? Yes. Okay, it's New York. Who knows? <laughs> okay. Okay. Dear God, in. Okay. Dear God, in releasing this man, I certainly. Oh my gosh, I surely feel as though my heart is crushed. I feel as though a limb is gone, a piece of myself now ripped away. I pray, dear God, for the power to love him so totally that I shall not be in pain. For my love, I know I shall set him free. Let me not be tempted to try and constrict him, either in my actions or in my thoughts. May he flee free. Ooh. May I appreciate the rightness of his need. No, keep going. Oh, keep okay. Going. I thought you were taking one. I need that. to travel. May I keep my faith in the wisdom of things. May I learn to respect his choices to go where he needs to go. If he finds another love, may that love flourish for your sake. For truly, the ark of love is blessing on all of us wherever he goes, dear Lord. Please go with him. May he be blessed in all doings, as all, all his doings. Please protect him. Bring him joy. May he, he always be happy. May he always be loved. May he find his way, amen. That is some difficult prayer. <laughs> it's a good one. Dear God, in releasing this man, I surely feel as though my heart is crushed. I feel as though a limb is gone, a piece of myself now ripped away. I pray, dear God, for the power to love him so totally that I shall not be in pain. For my love, I know, shall set me free. Let me not be tempted to try to constrict him, either in my actions or in my thoughts. May he fly free. May I appreciate the rightness of his need to travel. May I keep my faith in the wisdom of all things. May I learn to respect his choices to go where he needs to go. If he finds another love, may that love flourish for your sake. For truly, the ark of love is a blessing on us all. Wherever he goes, dear God, please go with him. May he be blessed in all his doings. Please protect him, bring him joy. May he always be happy. May he always be loved. May he find his way. Amen. And the Course in Miracles. <clears throat> so look at how this works. And this is why the Course in Miracles says prayer is the medium of miracles, because the miracle is the shift in your own perception. So the ego says, he hurt me. So the ego says, I am in pain because of what that person isn't giving me. But really, you're in pain because of what you're not giving them. Right? That's why the Course says only what you are not giving can be lacking in any situation. You have your hook in him, and to the extent that which you have your hook in him, the hook's in you. Take your hook out of him. May he be blessed. May he be happy. May he be loved. And I'll tell you something else, guys. If you have a hard time doing that at the end of the relationship, you probably weren't so good at it while you were in it. Does that make sense? 
you got a problem in love, oh yeah, there are prayers in this book for pretty much all of it. Okay? All right. Uh, that's what that is. So, ma'am, does that make sense to you? May he be blessed. May he make that almost your mantra. May he be blessed. May he be happy. May he be loved. May he be blessed. May he be happy. May he be loved. May he be blessed. May he be happy. May he be loved. Everybody that you think of, you are, as you think of other people, so shall it be for you. Okay? All right, who's next? Yes, sir. <clears throat> hey, Marianne. Thanks, honey. Um, I've heard you speak in LA a couple of times, and you always look really beautiful, Thank but you. today you look <laughs> amazing. Thank <you>. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Thank you. First of all, I want to accept the compliment on behalf of all women, and I want every man in the room to hear me when I say this on behalf of all women. We love it when a man says that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So um, I remember going to Sister Giant a couple of years ago. Cool. It's for men, too. It's not just for women. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, I talked to you about, I wasn't sure if I was going to stay in this country, become a citizen, or go back. Okay. And I remember you said, well, I hope that you stay. Uh, and I got my citizenship this year. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, and I voted for the first time. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, it's been really great. And the one thing... Oh, you know, I've always loved your uh, politics, uh, politics and spirituality mixed together. And uh, when I went there, the one thing I thought, like, well, how could I be more active? And you said that start in your own community. And so that's what I did in West Hollywood. I would go to lectures, and I wouldn't know how to, like, get involved in everything. And uh, it has led me to the UN. So thank you for that. Um, it's changed my life in a big way. And uh, I've been going to missions. This, uh, you know, like we met with the Danish mission, the Icelandic mission, the South African mission, talking about the independent expert on sexual orientation and gender identity, which came up to the General Assembly and the third committee voted on keeping it. And it's come up again. So we're going and talking to the missions to sort of stay vigilant. And my boyfriend and I are going to. Uh, Southeast Asia to do volunteer work with the LGBT community with everything that I'm learning this week with the UN. And that's all because of you. Oh, thank you. So, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> that is so beautiful. <laughs> thank you, thank you. What, so, country, what country did you come from? Originally Kuwait. Kuwait, yeah. right. Yeah. Right. And uh, so, uh, just from you saying... <laughs> you know, follow your passion and look for in your community. I didn't ever think that it would go this far. So it's, uh, if I hadn't gone to Sister Giant, I don't think that, you know, oh, I you would have... you would have gotten it somewhere else because it yeah. was time for you to get that. Yeah. So uh, as I leave on this journey with him, I just want to acknowledge um, what you've meant to me. And Thank I really you. appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you. May your travels be safe and blessed. Thank you. So beautiful, huh? So wonderful. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. <clears throat> Thanks. Hi, I'm Susan. Uh, a friend of mine spoke to me on Sunday and said that she had heard you speaking about the political atmosphere and that you were talking about outrage and the connection of outrage and love. And I would love to hear you say more about that. Well, one of the things I've said often is that moral outrage is not born of anger. Moral outrage is born of love. And one of the things that has led many in the transformational higher consciousness community to remain disengaged from politics is this kind of faux artificial idea of what spirituality means. Um, you know, if, if there are children playing in a, in a street and there are, is a car coming down the road at 70 miles an hour, of course I'm going to start screaming. Is that because I fear the car, or is it because I love the children? So many people say, if it brings up anything that's negative, that you're being negative, you're being a fear monger. So many people, obviously, we're living at a very tumultuous moment in our own politics. 
And many people voted for uh, President-elect Trump and are happy, and I respect that because this is a democracy. You get to vote for whoever you want to vote for. But many of us are not happy, and we, we don't have to be. Um, this is not a king, um, and many of us are deeply concerned. Uh, we see behavior that is, in our view, the behavior of a demagogue, uh, deep irresponsibility, uh, far right-wing appointments, which that's just fact. That's not opinion, that part. And that does not mean you're unspiritual. And we want to really think about that in terms of some of the historic moments. Um, if you saw someone in, in some other country in history when some of the worst things have happened, some of the questions that people have asked in retrospect were, how did they let it get that bad? And I think we're getting some insight. So I think that the idea that many of us are disturbed, and I know I, I get a lot of this like um, on my Facebook page, on social media, uh, where, you know, where's your spirituality? But as I said, I, I, I have no respect for preachers who preach during slavery and didn't call to task slave owners. I have no respect for leaders, including the Pope at the time. You know, during World War II, one of the interesting things is there was a petition to the Pope. The majority of, of leaders of the, of, the Nazi, uh, of the Nazi leaders were Roman Catholic. And the, the Pope was petitioned to declare the killing of a Jew a mortal sin because that would have really made a difference theoretically to many people who were Catholic. And he refused to do that. I have no respect for that. And I think all of us, I just see it in my own little way with all the, I'll never read your books again. And, you know, it, it hurts me and it causes me, oh my God. But I think all of us are faced this, at this moment with some real decisions about where we stand. Martin Luther King said, uh, your life uh, begins to end on the day you stop talking about things that matter. And I think one of the things that we're all faced with right now, if you are reading the paper, and I hope you are, you know, the president-elect has attacked the, Washington, the New York Times. I hope your response to that is to get a subscription. But more than that, I think there's a, it's a really important, you know, one of the principles of, of nonviolence is to be educated. <laughs> and, um, and there are good things in there today about all of this stuff. Every page is filled with the stuff that we need being educated, knowing what these, what these, uh, these um, appointments are, who they are, what they represent. And then you, we, like, and that's why Sister Giant, you know, it's, it's, not about, it's not about rage and anger, but it is about this will not, this just stop right there. You know, an African American, <clears throat> one, of, one of the reasons African Americans need to know their history, and one of the reasons Jews need to know their history, any, any formerly disempowered or, or disadvantaged or oppressed people, you have to know your history because you have to know the point at which behavior becomes such that you say to whatever prevailing system is, is perpetrating the injustice, stop right there. Because I know what happened when this happened 100 years ago. I know what happened when this happened. You know, history does repeat itself. Stop right there. And I think at this point, our, for, for those of us who believe this, and I respect those of us who do not believe this, but many of us do believe that this is the greatest threat to American democracy that we have ever encountered. And it is not unspiritual of us to say, stop right there. And to ask ourselves what that means. Not that those answers are easy, because there is much to consider right now. We want to be deeply aligned with truth, with understanding what's happening. Uh, what are the, the, within the system of our, democratic, of our democracy, what is true, what is accurate? Um, nobody has an easy plan forward. But this is a moment, you know, that in the, classic, in the classic stages of grief, the final one is acceptance. This is where we must not be in the classic stages of grief. We must not go into acceptance. I really appreciated Saturday Night Live this week. Uh, they made it clear they will not shut up and they will not back down. Uh, I loved Alec Baldwin. Uh, when the president-elect uh, started putting down SNL, you, they need to stop, he said. And Alec Baldwin tweeted, we'll stop when you release your tax returns. That is so American. I loved it. <clears throat> because this man was not elected as our king. And that's really important to remember. 
and that's free speech. So, you know, and not everybody agrees with what I just said, and that's okay too. We don't all have to agree. That's what freedom is. So I respect that some people totally hate what I just said. That's okay, but that doesn't mean I'm not going to say it so that you'll like me either. Thank you. Okay. Okay, yes, ma'am. You see why love and sex is such an easier conversation today. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to make it a little lighter. Pardon? I'm going to make okay. it a little lighter. Not that love and sex is lighter, you know, but I, you know, I, it's all the, And also, I just want to say one thing about this seriously. Um, and it's a very serious conversation about the love and sex and intimacy. Um, there is an issue here about strengthening the things that remain. I think one of the ways we, you know, it's like when you're about to take a journey, do I have everything I need for the trip, right? And we are going through now a very significant journey in our history. We've got a path ahead. We've got a journey ahead. And we need to be inwardly prepared. And so, you know, it's kind of like sometimes you say in, in life, I can handle problems in my career as long as my love life is okay, or I can handle problems in my love life as long as my career is okay. You have to have some area of life that's working, right? And so this idea of our losing it in every area. So you really want to really deepen. This is a time, it's a good time to not only read the newspaper, it's a good time to read great literature. It's a good time to see deep art, go to art exhibits, inwardly prepare your personhood. And that's what I mean about your, your love life, really deep in your relationships. We need to really be deep in our personhood and our deep humanity in order for us to be a field that can handle the journey ahead. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay, yes, ma'am. Um, you talk often about Pat Allen, and I, I, I love her I do too. Um, work. And she talks about having contracts with men uh, for the women, and, and is that, I, I don't know, sometimes it feels controlling and manipulative. Yeah, well, but her thing, it, sometimes it, it feels a little gamey, but there's a difference between a game and a dance. So the game you don't want, but there is a minuet. You know, by the way, if you, if you look at a minuet and a waltz, they're actually very sexy. You know, if you actually look at the dynamic of it and you kind of rise yourself above history because it's courtship and it's part of formality. So what Pat Allen says about, it, her thing is about the casualization, over-casualization of sex and that there are three agreements, right? One is continuity of communication, right? Uh, what, what is it she says? Continuity of communication, sex commitment, but what is commitment to? Sexual monogamy? having sex for a certain period of time. Yeah, okay, well whatever her, her particular issues are, this is what I think we do, whether you buy into the specifics that she talks about or not. Courtesy. I've done this, pardon? Courtesy. Courtesy, yeah. well she's right, we were talking about that tonight. One of the things, and I don't know if men do this, but women do this, and Pat Allen talks about it, and I know I've done this, and I, I know a lot of women do this. Pat Allen says men are not normally liars. They tell the truth until it is proven to them that it is not safe to do so. And she talks about how often a man told you he wasn't in it for more. He told you, and you either didn't believe him or thought, well, he just hasn't had me yet. <laughs> He'll change, because, because we are made up so that there is no way we could be in this moment and I'd walk away, so I can't imagine that you would, but he will or could. And if he didn't tell me he wouldn't, then I have to look back and go, well, he actually, he never said that. And you often, you know, I, I do think you know everything you need to know in the first 15 minutes. And I think a lot of times, I don't know how men work on this, but I know women do this, we edit. <laughs> we edit. And, ba and later we go, well, actually, if I, he did say this or he didn't say that, or I didn't, where, where Pan Allen comes in, I was afraid to ask because I thought it would take away from the sexiness of the moment, right? And then later, we blame him when really, he, you know, millions of years of evolution went into making him someone who would want to spread his seed. Millions of years of evolution made us into someone who would want to nest now. 
and learning to live consciously is to not live just on the animalistic level, but that takes work. And that's why the whole thing of the over-casualization of sex, you just go immediately into the impulse without the higher consciousness work on that. So it's, when some people say it sounds gamey, what they're really saying is it sounds unsexy to have that conversation because it is unsexy to have that conversation. But it's dangerous to not have it. Does that make sense? And the fact that a certain level of that kind of conversation slows things down is ultimately better. And then if it slows it down and just makes their, all that stuff go away, that tells you something. Does that make sense? Thank you. Yes, ma'am. That lady over there. <clears throat> Um, well, I was born in Germany, I'm German, and um, when Donald Trump, you know, announced that he wanted to become the president, I, I just couldn't believe it. Uh, and I didn't take it serious, unfortunately. Just couldn't believe that a man who, is a, who was a joke for me wants to be the president. Now, this is a reality. And what Hitler did, and many people fell for it, is telling them, I'm going to make this a great country again. And he, that's what he based his campaign on. So the irony is, when all this started like getting really serious that he was seeming to win, I started actually looking for a little bit more spirituality in my life, and I found you. And then I came the first time to a lecture here on an evening where you told the story about your friend who is voting for Trump and what your relationship looks like, how, how, how you deal with it. And you ended up saying, we will be okay, no matter who, who wins. And I said, I loved everything you say tonight, but I didn't love like that, because I really think, think we are in for a ride, a rough ride. And the cause of miracles, I'm a baby with a cause of miracles, and I'm really trying hard to, uh, to not be... Um, you know, critical of it and do my exercises. But very often I feel challenged that you have to accept the outcome because it's a democracy. I have not accepted it yet and I'm going, I'm, I'm, I'm being a rebel right now. I'm, I'm passing on the emails. Whenever I get an email to sign the petition, I ask all my friends, even the ones who voted for Trump, please sign this petition. I still have hope because I want your opinion. Now, actually, somebody who is in this collectoral college came out and said, I'm not going to vote for Trump, which is a big win. We are already many, many people who signed this petition. And there is another thing. I have a lot of hang-ups, but one thing I'm proud of is my intuition. I have this fear this man is going to be impeached. He cannot get away with so much more. He has overstepped the boundaries of what you are allowed to say to become a president. He should have been disqualified the first time he was talking. And that was telling people that Mexicans are, are, are rapists and criminals. It was it. That was not okay. presidential material. And he's too busy tweeting. He has to go. Okay. And I think he's going to be impeached. Okay. That I feel. And he's, right. he's going to be impeached. I understand. Okay. So let's, let, let's, of let's deconstruct this and talk about this rationally. First of all, what you just said, I will not accept it. And that's what I said five minutes ago, that the classic phase of acceptance is where we should not go. So I already said that I agree with you. Secondly, you said that I said, no matter what, we will be OK. Be, be clear what I meant by that. I didn't say, no matter what happens, we will be OK, because he, he'll be OK. That's not what I meant. I meant, no matter what happens, we will be OK, because we will remain alert and be our best. I have not suggested that we just accept some of the things that we're being asked to accept. The night of uh, the election, I did say, let's see what happens. But we have seen now many things since the night of the election. Now, there is a process here. One has to do with the changing the mind of the electors. But remember, there are, I think, 538 electors. And I think 18 have said that they changed their vote, maybe. And there was that op-ed in the New York Times today, the person who was saying, uh, somebody has her New York Times, somebody was holding, do you have it? Yes, 
It was yesterday's because it was in the New York Times today. He was talking about the Federalist Papers and the three things, and I can't remember the third one. That would be a reason for an elector to change their vote. That would be demagoguery. Some people feel that there is that. International ent entanglements. <laughs> some of, I mean, without, uh, I mean, it is extraordinary, some of what's going on. So right now, there are many, uh, on my Facebook page, I have the link to the Roger Wolfson article on Huffington Post, where it's the whole idea of the petitions that you can sign about the Electoral College, et cetera. We have something like 14 days. It is not reasonable at this moment to assume that they will change their vote, but it might happen. If they do not change their vote, then we are on to the next thing. And like you're saying, ma'am, some people feel impeachment. You know, the 25th Amendment is not only about um, high crimes and misdemeanors. It is also about the, re the recognition that a person is physically or mentally unfit. Now, I'm not saying the, how you, what you should think about any of this, how you should feel, or how you should act. But I'm saying this is the conversation in the air. And that's the thing, ma'am, when I said we will be okay. We will be okay because I believe that despite it all, this is a moment of awakening in this country. I haven't seen people so awakened in a long, I haven't seen people this awake since the 1960s. <laughs> and the fact that people don't know what to do doesn't mean we're not awake, because people are just kind of like watching. But this is such a time to, to, to read, to understand. And once again, that's part of why uh, Sister Giant, I'm, I'm putting Sister Giant together. That's why we're doing it right after the inauguration, February 2nd, 3rd, 4th, to deepen in both our understanding and to incubate not only ideas but also actions in these particular areas. So, um, yes, ma'am, I, I just think we should remember not everybody agrees with us, and that's cool, you know, that this is America, but don't be ashamed of what you do feel, and don't hesitate to act and to stand on what you do feel. Uh, the founders did give us a framework, and there is much to be done. So follow your own gut, follow your own uh, educated uh, assumptions, and uh, I will stand by what I said. We will be okay. Okay, one more, and then it's uh, time to go, I guess. Yes, sir. Hey, I, I have a question. Earlier in your lecture, you mentioned how certain relationships sort of force us to see the limits to the capacity of our love. All relationships. All relationships. So. <laughs> So my question is, how do you know when to walk away from a relationship, a friendship, a situation that is no longer serving you versus staying in, staying there. in okay. there? This is the thing. We all wish there was some external guidebook. If they say this, you stay. If they do that, you go. <laughs> the, we are taught as Course in Miracles students to follow the direction of an internal teacher. Holy Spirit, internal teacher, Jesus, whatever words you use. The Course in Miracles does say you, the Holy Spirit speaks to you through your brothers. You go to counseling, you talk to friends, you read books. Certainly we pick up, you know, sometimes something somebody says, that was it. That was the piece. But the bottom line is, what does your own heart tell you? But I will tell you this. The very question whether you stay or go isn't what it appears to be, because where your body goes is ultimately irrelevant. Because if you go, but you, you're taking the trauma with you, you didn't go even though you went. And you're just going to reenact it at the next place. So the issue is to get to that point. It's like when you were talking about we, you, you went through the agony. Whether you stay or go, you've got to go deep into that place. So the issue is to completely forgive this person, to find that point of forgiveness, whether the issue is to stay or to go. Not only that, until I completely forgive you, I can't know whether to stay or go. And if I haven't forgive you, given you and I go, I'm, I'm still carrying it. It might take us months before we talk again, but it's not over. It's still the stuff. And that's why the question that the ego asks is, do I stay or do I, do I go? The question the spirit asks is, how do I forgive? Now, obviously, that does not apply if there's physical violence or abuse or anything like that. Then zero tolerance, no question. But for most of us, it, we're in a gnarly web that's not about whether we stay or go. Now, sometimes it's easier to forgive if you go because it's easier to forgive someone when they're not in your face for a while. 
but ultimately just know where the body is is not the determiner of what's deeply happening. And it's not the determiner of what deeply is going to happen either with this person or with the person behind them. Does that make sense? OK. Any more questions on that topic before we go? OK, real quick. Yes, ma'am. Real quick, I, I, uh, I don't have a question, but I, I just want to say this. Um, I've been following you for a long time, and uh, on my spiritual walk, as far as triggers, one of the things that I've noticed for me is that, is that nobody triggers me. I get triggered by them. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that's been helping me, I have very much noticed this, even with my relationship with this woman, everybody around me, and especially my, my romantic relationships, is that each man that has been in my life has totally shown me, um, I've had so many lessons through them. They were all, even the people at work, you know, I'm a flight attendant by trade, and I see people at work, and I get triggered. And it's because they, on some level, remind me of something when I was a child, mm -hmm. my mother or my father. That's right. And this has been my healing. This has been the empowerment. This has been the forgiveness. Mm -hmm. And it's not about, well, I forgive you because I condone what you're doing. It's about what is the anger doing to me? Of course. Absolutely. What is the script that I'm making for my mom to be a certain way so that I can feel better. Mm -hmm. How is that affecting me every single day? She doesn't come home with me. These people don't come home with me when I'm angry. I'm home with that. That's and right. just this week, I had a trigger. It was jealousy. And I sat back and I thought about it. And I realized I didn't want to be happy for this person. But I admit to that. I felt the feeling. Mm -hmm. And I realized that it's loss. My loss, not his. And on the deeper level, I want love for him. On a deeper level, I want love for my mother. On a deeper level, I want love for my alcoholic, my addict brother. So I'm learning what is it I'm responsible mm -hmm. for what I think, say, and do in my reactions. Absolutely. This, this path is mm -hmm. empowering. And I love your open-mindedness. Uh, I love what you've been teaching. And it's been helping me to constantly look at my role in every relationship because it absolutely has nothing, absolutely nothing to do with anyone else. But what it has to do is with me. You know, how am I feeling, my reaction to this situation? And what I realize within 15 minutes of that jealousy, I realized that I was setting a script. I don't want you to be with that person That's so right. I can feel better. That's right. Oh my God. The Course in Miracles says you bring shadow figures from your past. You're bringing your father here, you're bringing your mother here, and you're not even seeing that person, exactly as you said. So I'm feeling needy because you remind me of my father who wasn't all that interested. You're feeling engulfed because you've been engulfed by your mother. That's why the avoidant meets the attic, blah, 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 yada, 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 yada. But the point is to get to that place of how do you get out of that gnarly web. Like you said, we bringing the shadow figures from the past. And as the Course in Miracles says, you pay a very high price for not taking 100% responsibility for your experience. That price is that you will not be able to change it. Just exactly what you so eloquently said. If you don't see that this is about me, then even if I go to another person, I'm going to be reenacting this because I'm trying to get some other person to give me what I think daddy didn't give me, but this is not daddy standing in front of me. And also what you were saying, as we've been saying tonight, only what you are not given can be lacking in any situation. The only thing I want to add is that what this woman said, because everything you were saying was so great, and when you said it's my jealousy, what do you do from A Course in Miracles perspective when those thoughts of jealousy come up? What do you do when those thoughts of neediness come up? What do you do when those thoughts of anger come up? When this gentleman said, how do you say it to the person? You go to God. By definition, if I'm not at lo in love and peace, I am insane in that moment. Don't take it to the person. Take it first to God. Dear God, I'm clearly insane in this moment because, <laughs> because I am not at peace. And I give these thoughts to you. I pray that the Holy Spirit come into my mind and change my thinking. Now, once your thinking is changed, because the Holy Spirit will realign your thinking, that's what a miracle is, it might be that then there's nothing to say to the other person. It has nothing to do with the other person. Or it might be that there is communication to have with the other person, boundaries or whatever, but I will be coming from such a completely different place when I say it, and my very choice of words will be guided from above. Does that make sense? Yeah. Thank you for saying that. That was very eloquent sharing. Thank you, ma'am. OK. And you know, ultimately, 
the issues of love, whether we're talking about love or intimacy or politics or anything else, these are ultimately the same, the same principles. Okay, all right, we are about to say our final prayer. Uh, I, I hope once again all of you will look at sistergiant.com, register if this feels right to you. Uh, it is priced in such a way uh, that hopefully we will cover the cost, but obviously if uh, uh, that's a stretch for you, we're asking $150 um, for live attendance for the two and a half day conference. It's, it's Thursday night, all day Saturday, then until about five or six on Saturday. Um, I think there's a, a cheaper price before January 8th. Is that right? Uh, something like that. And same with the live stream. But we have scholarships available as well. So um, that's never, money is not something that would uh, have to keep anybody from being there or from live stream. Okay? All right. Thank you very much. As my mother would say, God willing, we will be here next Tuesday. <clears throat> and so we pray, dear God, as we take this moment to join we send our love, our peace, our goodwill to each other. We send our love and our peace and our goodwill to all sentient beings, to all the people and the animals of the world. We pray for Charlie, for Nicole, for Matthew, for Garrett, for Brenda and for Jamie, for Abusha, for Allison, for Christopher, and for Uncle John. We pray, dear God, that we be the people that you would have us be, that we might do as you would have us do. And now go forth in confidence and go forth in peace, for there are angels to your left and angels to your right, angels in front of you and angels behind, angels above you and angels below. There is a path of golden light already paved in God's mind. In every moment, open your heart that you might walk along this path. And if in any moment you are confused or fearful and do not know what to think or what to do, reach out your hand as would a little child for the guidance of an elder brother. This is no idle fantasy. He is here. And so it is with a blessing upon all the world, dedicating ourselves that we might be used as vessels through which God might flow in love and forgiveness and compassion and mercy. Together we say, amen. Everyone, I will be in the back parlor. Uh, for anybody who wants to have a conversation and wants to know more about Sister Giant, I will be there. Thank you so much. See you next week. Bye. Thank you.